The next years were the most active ones which I ever spent, though I was occasionally unwell and so lost some time. I took lodgings in Great Marlborough Street in London and remained there for nearly two years until I was married. During those two years, I completed many reports based on the findings from the Beagle Voyage. Most notably, I completed my book on the zoology of the Voyage of the Beagle and my more popular travelogue, The Voyage of the Beagle. In July 1837, I started what would become a series of notebooks in which I speculated privately about the origin of species, a topic which had haunted me since the final months of the Beagle voyage. I had previously believed that God had created each species separately, but I had come to wonder whether instead new species were modified descendants of previously existing species. And if so, how that modification took place. I decided I could learn something about the origin of species from studying the art of breeding. I spoke to many domestic animal breeders and joined two pigeon fancier societies. Well, I believe you know how I resolved the entire issue in my mind. Professor Beatty suggested that I agonized over it. I assure you that agony is an understatement. I fear that it may have affected my health, which was inexplicably horrible from the time I arrived back in England for the rest of my life. It showed, too, in my face. Here I am when I shortly returned home from my voyage, and here on the eve of the publication of The Origin of Species. Yes, religion was a part of it. Had I murdered my own God? I had initially intended only to attribute to him a different role in the creation. At first, I thought it even a grander role. But the more I thought about the issues, the more complicated they became. I became more and more unsure. Stay with us for a while. I would Ready. love to. Religion was involved. Natural history in Darwin's time was about religion. In Darwin's time, certainly for the young Darwin, it was not only acceptable to invoke God, it was really the only reasonable and evidentially well-grounded way to account for organic form. How was one to explain the fact that organisms have parts that are shaped and combined and arranged to facilitate their survival and reproduction in the environments that they inhabit? For example, how else to explain the fact that ducks have bills that are appropriate for straining food from water together with webbed feet to propel them through that environment? Well, eagles, on the other hand, have long, sharp talons to carry away their dinner, together with sharp, pointed, curved beaks for tearing and devouring it. Imagine a duck-billed eagle with a salmon in its talons. What would it do next? Or how far would an eagle's talons propel a duck in the course of a day? The appropriateness of organic form that we actually find in nature and the inappropriateness that we can only imagine is quite sensible given the hypothesis that each species was created by a benevolent and intelligent designer, benevolent enough to care about each species' perpetuation and intelligent enough to ensure it. Otherwise, the widespread appropriateness of form in the living world would be an inc inconceivably lucky accident. And it's not just a matter of what's conceivable. It's also a matter of witnessing. Whenever we've witnessed the origin of a complex object whose parts are shaped and arranged and combined so as to facilitate its overall functioning, that object we know to have been produced, we've seen to have been produced by an intelligent designer. Has anyone ever seen a telescope formed in any other way than by an intelligent designer? 
a telescope maker. Why then, on the basis of what observable evidence, would one argue that the eye, which works on the same optical principles as a telescope, is not the product of an intelligent designer? All the evidence that we do have suggests otherwise. But in Darwin's time, and this is crucial, uh, God could also be invoked unacceptably. And there was perhaps no greater faux pas in this regard than that committed by the otherwise very accomplished naturalist uh, and contemporary of Darwin, Charles um, uh, Philip Goss. It's a somewhat sad fact uh, that in spite of many positive contributions, one may be remembered eternally for a singular misstep. Uh, the misstep for which Goss is remembered um, today is this book, uh, Omphalos. It's a Greek word that I'll translate shortly. What Goss set out to do in Omphalos was to explain a problem, uh, a problem having to do with the relationship between uh, science and religion. And the problem was that the earth looked much older than uh, the Bible allowed. Um, in the fossil record of the earth, uh, we find uh, evidence of many species existing in the past that we have no record of that would seem to have long lived long before humans were around uh, to, to note it. Um, by the time Goss wrote, um, it was common to believe that there were iguanodons, pterodactyls in the air, um, way larger versions of crocodiles and alligators than we have now, and so on. Um, this would suggest, again, a very long history of the Earth prior to the, the existence of humans. Um, in order to reconcile what the Earth's fossil record suggested with um, what uh, the Bible suggested, uh, Goss came up with a theory. And this theory, to understand this theory, let's get back to the term omphalos, which is Greek for navel or belly button. Um, the belly button in question is Adam's, Adam, the first human. Why did Adam have a navel? Adam had no mother. He was attached to by a placenta. Um, but Adam obviously had a navel. Our most religiously inspired artists show us Adam with a navel over and over. Where there are some, some uh, representations of Adam where he has the fig leaf pulled up a bit to, to, uh, to make the issue not so quick. But most, I mean, we just know that Adam had a navel. But why? The navel is a false sign of prior existence. Well, if Adam had a navel, then the earth as a whole might have false signs of a prior existence. God created Adam with a navel, and he created the world with a fossil record. <laughs> Goss was so excited uh, at the happy reception he thought that his book uh, would bring uh, it was absolutely panned uh, by all his fellow naturalists who believed that he had attributed the world's features to a deceiving God. He had invoked God in absolutely the wrong way. In attempting to convince his peers of the advantages of an evolutionary over a creationist perspective, Darwin might have argued that the creationist account does not live up to the standards of good science, that science and theology are entirely separate provinces, that there's no place for theology in science. But he didn't. Rather, he argued that evolutionary accounts of organic form are superior to creationist accounts, in part on theological grounds. Over and over in The Origin of Species, he complained that creationist accounts, like Goss's account, misportray the creator. In particular, creationist accounts portray God as capricious, as acting one way rather than another for no other reason than that it pleases him to do so. This phrase, it pleases him to do so, occurs over and over and over in The Origin when Darwin's critiquing special creationism. <clears throat> 